I want to talk to you just a little bit today about uh, the bank robbery that occurred. Several bankers here, and, and a lot of interest has been, has been uh, made in that issue that happened down in Eufaula last month. Uh, man was a wanted criminal out of Oklahoma and just went on a crime spree through Texas and, and Oklahoma. Had been released from prison. Uh, I don't know what his background is as far as his, the crimes he's committed. I don't think bank robbery was one of the crimes he ever committed. Robbery was. Robbery was, but he had just pled in Creek County on a robbery and he was given 10 years DOC. They sent him to Tulsa where he pled to charges in Tulsa and got a consecutive sentence. Tulsa sent him to Texas. Once they were done with him, instead of holding him, they let him release. Right. And then we played the blank game about whether or not they received the hold. And, yes. And, but nevertheless, he made his way up Highway 69 to Eufaula, where he decided he was going to do a bank robbery. And there were several things uh, I don't know any more than you do about what occurred at the bank. Just from what I've seen on TV, the one of the individuals who was shot in the bank that survived did what I believe is probably uh, the most courageous thing she could have done, which was not go. Train. We're told and train not to. Yeah. But when you're staring down the muzzle of that weapon, you're gonna. There's no telling what you're gonna do. You'll do as you're trained if you're if you have enough training. In this particular case, she wasn't going. And that's the right thing to do because if you're going to get shot at a bank robbery, let it happen in the bank. You have a much better chance of surviving at the bank than you do being shot on the side of the road. You know in the bank you have health coming. All right. Now, it's not often that you meet an outlaw like this individual who's willing to kill you at the drop of the hat. This person had made the decision that he wasn't going to live very much longer and no one was going to stop him and whatever his intentions were. Um, from that bank robbery to the shooting that occurred last week, in between here and Omaha, where the officer shot the truck driver, uh, we'll probably never know exactly why um, the truck driver ran off the road and, and started the series of events. We do know this, he was out on um, bond as a suspect in the murder of his wife in Sequoia County. Now, I knew when we got there and he, and he was laying on the gurney, he had a ankle monitor on, which I thought, you know, was fairly <laughs> You know, and the second thing that came to mind was you have a criminal with an ankle monitor on who has a weapon. So, if you ban Keith from being able to own a weapon, you're not fixing the problem. The problem in my eyes, when we start, and I won't go way off on this, but the problem in my eyes with firearms are, where's the mandatory minimums for people who use firearms to commit crimes? And where are they at? Well, we're going to address, we need to, the firearm itself, the the item itself, but we're not going to address those who use firearms to commit crimes. And that's just my opinion. That, that should be the first thing we should do is address them. Um, but we're starting to live in a time now where uh, shootings occur almost routinely, and then we start to get numb to even the reports on TV about, you know, this person was murdered or that person was murdered. And then we focus a lot on officer-involved shootings. Um, there has been seven officer-involved shootings in Omogi County since 2011. And that's a lot. That is a lot of shootings. Um, out of those seven, one officer was shot in the face. Okay. Um, a couple of the incidents I don't have intimate details on, but in most of those, the suspect was armed with either a large knife or a firearm. Um, in the case of the officer who was shot in the face, they got a call up in the north part of the county, went to the residence, and once inside the residence, 
the suspect just opened up on, like in a hallway inside the residence, and ended up shooting a deputy in the face. He stayed in the fight for approximately 10 minutes before other officers got there and got him out of the house. But he continued to stay in that house and fight for his life. Um, and that's brave. Because in America, about every 60 hours, a police officer is killed in the line of duty. About every 60 hours. Now, they're not always shot. Some are ran over on the side of the road, and you know, some are in car accidents. Uh, but about every 60 hours in America, a law enforcement officer dies. And uh, Keith, if you were guessing how much a police officer in, in Omogee County makes, what would you guess be annual salary? 30, 40 now? The average salary in Omogee County for a police officer is about $28,000. <laughs> Let me sign up. Well, and that's the thing. It's not a job that you know when you get into it that you're going to get rich. But when the pay for law enforcement doesn't increase, um, I would say in the last 10 years, um, you haven't seen a 10% increase in law enforcement pay in this county. Now, some of that has to do with the economics. And, but <coughs> nevertheless, the way it is now, it's tough to get an applicant to go to work. And you'll always have those applicants that you, you know you'll never hire. You'll go short before you hire them. And so you've got to try to seek out people who really have it in their heart to be, you know, a person who will run towards danger and not run away from them. And then even then, sometimes you hire them and you bring them in and you don't know that until they're faced with that situation. So... You know, we're short one officer right now, and, and we're trying to hire a particular person and then anticipate losing another officer in the next month who's moving out of state. You know, those are tough positions to fill. Another agency in this county is five people down, and they can't find enough people to do it. Uh, but when you think about it like this, you go to work one day, and if you make a bad decision, and they have their, in a, in a suspect has the right attorney, you know, you could be, you can get a judgment against you that you're paying on the next five or ten years. Now there's one important thing I've learned in law enforcement. Uh, for most police officers, they are what attorneys, or some attorneys, not all, <laughs> some attorneys would call an uncollectible judgment. If you win a million dollars against me, I'm pretty much an uncollectible judgment. You're not going to ever get a million dollars from me. Um, and you try to tell those new people when they go to Cleet, they're told uh, over and over and over how they can be sued. But when they get out of Cleet, they're so afraid to do anything, uh, and, and their view of, of how the world really works in law enforcement is so skewed, they don't, they're afraid. So you have to tell them, look, if you, somebody wins a million dollar judgment against you, what are they going to get? Okay? But you got to make sure that you do everything right. If you lose a judgment or lose a, a case where you're going to owe someone money in the future, make sure you did everything you thought you could possibly do right. If a jury decides you didn't do it right, you can't fix that. There's nothing you can do about that. All right, But you can't go out and do things wrong. Now, we were one of the first agencies uh, anywhere in our area to wear body cameras. And that has been really good for us. It, it shows some uh, training issues that we've had. It showed uh, a couple of different times. It showed officers doing things they shouldn't do. Illegal, no. Uh, but just different things they should do. And uh, we've been able to learn from those. And on more than one occasion, we've had complaints come in about officers and been able to immediately walk over uh, to the server and watch the entire incident on audio and video recorded. And that has stopped a lot of complaints. A lot of the complaints have stopped. 
So we're trying to do everything we can at Henrietta Police Department to make sure that our guys uh, are trained and are equipped with the things they need to perform their job effectively. In addition, they need to be professional and treat everybody as human beings. Because it's real easy to get callous. When you deal with the same man and woman who fight every weekend and get intoxicated and you're out there every weekend, you just get tired of dealing with them. But you got to remember that the police are only contacted when the community is at their worst. No one calls you to their house and says, hey, just want to say good job. Mm -hmm. Call you to your house and go, my wife came home drunk again. You know, or, you know. But anytime that anyone in this city or otherwise that has a dealing with, with my police department and they don't feel like they were treated right, I encourage you to contact me. Because sometimes I may not know something's going on. I can't be with all 12 of these police officers at one time. And uh, I encourage people to give me a call if they have an issue. Uh, I also encourage if an officer uh, goes above and beyond, let me know that. Because it never hurts to, to give those guys a pat on the back. And uh, I know that Judge Gaither uh, sees a lot of the work that the police department does also sees things from time to time he, that things should change. Doesn't have a problem talking to me about, you know, what we should do or, or uh, I don't mind criticism from him. He's a good guy. Right? And it comes all the time, right? <laughs> right. Well, I was going to say good looking. But, <laughs> but do you guys have any questions for me about um, anything that I've talked about? Yes. You said a big thing with the budget you know, issues in every city, every town. And unfortunately, they're always the ones that are cut first, the people that you need. And you want them at the other end of the phone. What do you think about the uh, Robert Bates case? Well, not knowing all the details, um, I will tell you my stance on reserve officers. And that is. When I came to Henrietta as chief in 2009, I canceled the reserve program. Number one is we didn't have uh, the manpower to train those volunteers the way I feel like they should be trained. <laughs> Number two, I've always felt like reserves were a liability if they weren't managed and trained properly. When you start getting into a department the size of Tulsa County Sheriff, uh, you know maybe they have the people to train them, maybe they don't. I don't. I, I know that politically the sheriff has to uh, entertain a lot of different people, and I'm sure there's a lot of folks that may want to be a police officer or or carry a badge that may have political influence and move their way in. Now, in the Bates case, I don't know because I don't really know anything about him. But I know that the fears I have over reserves uh, were, were almost justified to myself by watching that video. Now, having said that, he, he uh, I do not believe that he acted with malice or forethought. He made a mistake. And... He was charged with the crime, just as he should be. Uh, so the argument that's gone on about how terrible the Tulsa County Sheriff's Department is, I don't believe in that. I believe what he did uh, was wrong. He made a mistake, and the district attorney's office believed that it, it was criminal, so they charged him criminally. Well. So that, that's how the justice system works. So the argument of the sheriff's office not doing what they're supposed to be doing, I think, is mute. He committed an act, the district attorney thought it was illegal, and charged him with a crime. Now there's one thing that I feel like is important in a lot of these different cases, 
where the officer shoots someone. Less so much the Bates case. In the case of in Ferguson, Missouri, the case in New York, um, when you ask an officer to hold court on the side of the road, you're asking for trouble. Okay? If you run from the police or if you fight with the police, okay, you're 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 just asking for trouble. Don't ask a police officer to have court on the side of the road. Submit. If you believe that it's unjustly you're unjustly being arrested, the best thing for you to do is submit to the arrest and handle it the legal way. Okay? Running from the police or fighting with the police is the wrong thing to do. Most of these cases where people died um, by, from law enforcement, had they not ran or fought, they would probably still be alive. And if they felt like they were unjustly arrested at that point, there was avenues after the arrest they could take and you know, argue their point that they were unjustly arrested. But people are choosing to try to have court on the side of the road. And that's just the wrong place to try to have it. So. I know I had to call you a couple years ago. I had a mental health kind of issue with the person who just walked in my office. And, uh, you know, that, that's the kind of situation that probably makes me more fearful than anything else is because I don't know what they're capable of or what they're thinking. You see a lot of mental health issues? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that The mental health, dealing with the mental health people is... You know, it's, it's kind of just another unfunded mandate for law enforcement. Um, law enforcement is typically the dustpan. So whatever no one else will pick up, they sweep it into the police department. You know, we, we, uh, we don't budget to take um, the people who struggle with mental health issues to the hospitals, but we're required to take them. You know, if they threaten to hurt themselves or others, you know, we're required by state statute to take those folks, you know, to a mental health facility. Well, it's not to all wonky, you know, it's taking someone out of town and then you may have to sit with them at the hospital to be evaluated. You know, we're a department that has two two officers on at all times. Well, in the event that someone has to take one of those mental health uh, patients somewhere there could be a short amount of time where you only had one officer on um, you know and you you talk about calls for service we we answer between eight and ten thousand calls for service every year which is a ton of calls for our, for our area that's a ton of calls we take about a thousand reports a year and we arrest a little over I won't guess on the arrest. It's over. It's probably, never mind, I'm not going to guess. It's more than you think it is. But we, the mental health issues in America are something that the government is going to have to look at at some point. Because then you have these folks who run out of, of uh, medicine, and they know that all they have to do is call the police department and say, hey, you know, I want to hurt myself. We got to come pick them up and take them to Sepulveda, you know. So they're abusing it at the same time, and uh, you know we don't financially we can't keep up with them. We're transporting them several a week, all the time, and they, if they present themselves at, at our hospital, then we have to deal with them. We have a gentleman's agreement with the other departments in the in the county that. Wherever they live, that jurisdiction is responsible for the transport. But that's just an agreement. If at any time the sheriff or Oklahoma Police Department decides, man, eh, if they go to Henrietta Hospital, they're yours, then uh, you know, that's a fish that we caught we're going to have to clean. And there's no money for that. It's just saying you're going to do it whether you like it or not. And uh, my argument and uh, has always been, you know, we're not a court officer, and those are people that are basically uh, orders from the court that they go to have mental health evaluations. Well, we're not the court officer. 
but the state don't care. You can't leave them sitting out here. Say, if someone threatens themselves or others, then it's called an EOD. And so they can take them there to a mental health facility. But the problem is also in his funding, if you look to the mental health funding, mental health is abysmal. So when these people get there, they're there for a matter of a day or two, or at most a few weeks, then they're out. And they're right back in there because there is no funding for some permanent solutions, yet mental health and drug addiction is responsible for an excess of 90% of all crime. Absolutely. And then you take uh, businesses like Creos. They get a state contract to handle mental health uh, patients in Omogi County. My question to the senator was, why can't their contract include transportation? Apparently they never thought of it, you know. But no one wants to take full responsibility for it. So what they do is sweep it into our pan. Law enforcement will do it. So going back to Jeremy's question, you know, we said as a hostage, you know, don't ever go as a hostage. But when we have those people in our office, normally I honestly just try to send them around the corner to Jeremy's office. <laughs> 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 Away, but I, make sure I'm there. <laughs> I mean, how do we handle those people? Just call us. Because you try to, you know, be nice and just send them, but they don't leave. And just a lot more than I've ever seen. I, <laughs> yeah, because they either, they really do. They come to my office and they go to Jeremy's office. So for a while, we can call like, hey, lock your door, you know. Just call but, us. I mean, we'll deal with them more than likely with somebody that we know, we have a relationship with. Because it's not a situation where, you know, typically law enforcement, when they deal with mental health uh, patients like that, we know them. You know, we've dealt with them before. Yeah, we, we called the policeman walked in the door and he called him by his first name. He yeah. just said, hey, Johnny, what are you doing in here? Yeah. Come yeah. on, yeah. let's go. That, and that's just it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another issue. We are, getting, <laughs> we are getting inundated with people from Muskogee, Tahlequah, Salisaw, they move here because it's cheap to live. Where are they moving to? I mean, what is their, There's, you know, are these motel low cost motels that's turned into apartments and low cost apartments where all your bills are paid, things like that. They move here for that, you know. And I'll, hey, I'm, I'm not against people, but what are we attracting? <laughs> You know, maybe we should take a look at that. You know, we don't always, you know, we want to attract more people to move here and live here. But there could come a time where we need to be more selective on what we're looking to attract. Is Henrietta a safe town? Yes, it is. It is. If you want to take crime statistics and measure them against other towns, yes, it's a safe town. Um, but there's increase in crime throughout America. You know, what we would consider safe now wouldn't have been safe 25 years ago. So, uh, you know, and I always try to finish with, you know, if you see something, no one knows their neighborhood better than the people who live in it. Call us. If something looks out of the ordinary, call us. Let us, let us come, you know, check it out. And I'll tell you, if I show up and I don't know them, they're not from here. I know everybody. And if I don't know you, you're not from here. And, uh, you know, we'll ask them, what are you doing here? I don't have a problem doing that. I've been called on the, on the carpet in court for why did you stop this guy? Well, it's my job sometimes to check people out. We get a call, we show up. Sometimes it's my job, and that upsets people. But the truth of the matter is, is I'm going to make sure that our community is safe. And we're glad that you are so that we don't have to. We're glad we can call you. We're glad that we can count on you to, to come do something about it rather than having to deal with it ourselves. We truly are. Well, thank you. And I'm glad that you guys have